Welcome to Upper House, an initiative of the Stephen and Laurel Brown Foundation. Located in the heart of UW-Madison, we gather, inquire, worship, and learn. We engage around the arts and humanities, science, society, justice, vocation, and theology. We explore the life of the mind and the questions of the soul and seek to engage our world more faithfully and wisely. We're glad you're here. Hello, hello. Thank you all for being here. It's good to see all of you. My name is Rebecca. Um, with me is our executive director, John Terrell. We are your MCs for the evening. Um, and we would just like to thank you for joining us for the culmination of a project that has been the last couple years in the making. We are very excited for the UW Spiritual History Project. And um, it's just a pleasure to host you for these celebrations. So what we have ahead of us for this evening, first, we have the privilege, one might say the honor, of having a presentation from our colleague, Dan Hummel, who was the lead for this entire project. After which we will hear introductions to the various components of this project by their creators, John Dahl and Scott Wilson. After that, we will have a documentary viewing. So this is a full on red carpet premiere kind of scenario. And then to finish out the evening, we will have a Q and A with a panel with the three creators that you get to hear from this evening. Now I keep mentioning these components of the project. So I wanna highlight what those are briefly. First, there is an essay, and we have an essay reserved for you specifically. Now, printing was delayed on these essays, um, and so we will contact you. We will send you an email when those come in, and if you're on campus, we will try to hand deliver those to you. If you frequent Upper House, you can come by and grab a copy, but when the immaculate printed versions come, we will let you know so that you can have your very own copy. In the meantime, uh, you will receive an email tonight with a PDF version of that essay, and you can also find a PDF version of the essay on Upper House's website. If for some reason you just really need a physical copy this evening, we do have some printed versions for you at the front desk that you can grab on your way out. So that's the first component of the project. The second component is a documentary made by Scott Wilson, and it is called A Brief History of Faith at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, this is 20 minutes of interviews and stories with faculty and leaders on campus that contributed to the story of faith here at this university. And then the final component is a walking tour created by our board member, John Dahl. He was just giving these tours to friends for many years. And what we have done is recorded John sharing this information. And he actually guides you to walk to physical spots on campus and learn the spiritual significance of those places. You can find all of these components on Upper House's website, upperhouse.org. It's at the bottom of the screen. And it's on the main page. You don't even have to search. It's just right there for you. I think I've said all I needed to say, so I will turn it over to John Terrell. Well, it is great to see so many friendly faces. Thank you for being here. I wanna show you actually the physical copy of this document. Um, it's beautiful. Um, it has pictures and images. And it's a real one. Um, so this is just a mock-up, but it's, it's really a beautiful uh, piece, and we look forward to getting that to to you as soon as possible. We just think it's a matter of days, maybe a week or so. Well, we're delighted to have you here to celebrate our great university. Um, and as you will learn today, uh, religious commitment has been a major part of the formation and the evolution of UW Madison. We celebrate our 150, 175th birthday uh, this year, and it's been. Um, a major component, a thread that's run all the way through, and you'll learn, you'll hear about that tonight. I think we often falsely conclude that religion doesn't um, have a role in our public institutions; that we ought to seal it off in some ways, um, relegate it to the to the margins, um, and that would certainly include our flagship uh, universities, public universities. Although I would argue, and I think most here would agree, that. Um, Although a public university shouldn't favor one religion over another, um, part of what it means to be human is to bring our whole selves 
into the learning process. And so part of what we're going to learn about tonight and see and experience is how um, the University of Wisconsin has um, enabled um, and at times uh, committed itself to spiritual and religious expression that allows for the fullness of who we are to, um, to come into the learning process. We're also going to learn a lot about um, faithful faculty, staff, administrators, and students. And I just want to stop and acknowledge um, so many that have gone before us. I think one of the things that's so wonderful about a history like this is you just begin to recognize all of the, the people who have committed from presidents to faculty to administrators to, to helping find a role for religion um, at a public university, that it can be something that brings value and adds to the texture of the conversation. And so as we pause to, to, I'm going to specifically thank some individuals. I just want to pause and really thank our forebears. So many people that have gone before us um, that have made this institution what it is. And we're going to learn about some of them tonight. And I think we owe them a great uh, debt of gratitude. There are a couple entities and organizations I'd like to thank before we get started. First of all, I'd like to thank the John Templeton Foundation. They were the impetus for this initiative. They gave us a grant on our Higher Pursuits project, and they had a real vision for how um, exploring the spiritual history of UW-Madison could add real value. So I just want to I want to thank them for, for freeing up money um, and, and, and just helping us get this thing done. I want to thank Scott Wilson. You're going to hear from Scott Wilson. He served as a consultant on the Higher Pursuits project, and he was the producer of the documentary, uh, and you'll learn more about him tonight. We're going to premiere that tonight. I'd like to thank a couple colleagues. Um, all the entire Upper House team has contributed, but there's a, a few colleagues that were really focused on this project, and I want to thank them: Susan Smetzer Anderson, Cam Anderson, uh, Rebecca Cooks, Gene Collins, and Dan Johnson played pivotal roles on the project and/or the grant. So thanks to all of them. And then I want to thank John Dahl, um, who's a board member, as you've been told, and you many of you know. He's also a long-term uh, university sta grad and faculty ministry staff worker. He's been here like, I don't know, 50 years or something. Um, he's, been in, he's been in every broom closet on campus. Um, so anyways, he's a long-term tenure, and um, really a lot of this comes out of his commitments. And then lastly, I want to thank Dan um, Hummel. Um, he's, uh, I called him a decorated historian <laughs> earlier today. He's a decorated um, <laughs> American religion historian. Um, he serves on our upper house team um, as the um, director of university engagement. Without Dan's vision, wisdom, and tenacity, and his really good scholarship, uh, this project would not have come to fruition. Uh, Dan is a regular commentator on church, culture, and American religion. Um, he's the author of dozens of articles, the groundbreaking work we're going to celebrate today, as well as two books, uh, Covenant Brothers, Evangelicals, Jews, and U.S.-Israeli Relations, and then a forthcoming book, which I'm really excited about, uh, published by Erdman's um, with the title, The Rise of Dispensationalism, How the Evangelical Battle Over the End Times Shaped a Nation. Sounds ominous, doesn't it? Um, anyways, we're super excited to welcome Dan to the stage. Dan, come on up. I'm going to say the same thing uh, I said earlier today, which is I'm not a decorated historian. I'm a plain historian, and I wear that proudly. Um, uh, I want to, again, uh, this is the second time, this is the second event we've hosted today. So I want to thank my colleagues who are uh, manning the hospitality uh, part and the tech and everything else. Um, it's really fun to be part of a team where uh, things just go so smoothly that uh, I can focus on uh, giving this talk. And I also want to thank John. Um, I want to uh, just thank John in particular for having the vision for um, this project and seeing the merit in it, even more than I did when we started. And so I really appreciate John pushing me. This was all the way back in early 2020 to sort of put this in the Templeton grant. Um, and uh, I was a little sort of uh, uh, low on the sort of... Uh, uh, confidence meter of, of how much this would actually help doing some history. John saw it. I'm really glad uh, we did it. It's, it's turned into a really good project. Um, okay, so today, tonight, I want to begin with a story. It is 86 years ago, 1937, 
on the campus of UW. It is March. It is cold. There's a lingering winter. Sound familiar at all to uh, today? Uh, the university is closing in on its 100th anniversary. It's grown immensely since it was founded in 1848, when there were just 19 students enrolled. In 1937, there are something like 10,000 students attending UW. Our story centers on a particular graduate teaching assistant in the English department. He's a young man, 26 years old, working on a degree at Cambridge University, but he's in Madison for a year to help pay his bills. He makes $895 as a teaching assistant that year. His name is Marshall. He's Canadian, and in his first time in the U and he's in his first time in the U.S. And he later wrote about his time in Madison. He said, "When I arrived at Wisconsin, I found that there was probably more culture in the town of Madison than the whole of Canada. I had to jettison my views of the United States and do it in a hurry." Beyond the culture shock, Marshall had a profound, life-altering change while in Madison. But that change wasn't about his social, political, or cultural views. It was religious in nature. Marshall had grown up Methodist and drifted into what he self-described as an agnostic mode. But during his graduate work, he became increasingly drawn to the Catholic Church. On Holy Thursday in March of 1937, Marshall McLuhan, yes, that Marshall, was received into the Catholic Church at St. Paul's just across the street. And I'll explain real quickly who Marshall McLuhan is if you're, if you're not uh, clued into him. Marshall would attend St. Paul's for the rest of his time in town. Later that year, he moved to a Catholic university in St. Louis and embarked on a career that would more or less define the field of media studies for a generation, winning him the nickname Prophet of the Electronic Age and giving us memorable phrases like the medium is the message and what he called the global village, describing in the 1960s what was essentially the Internet. McLuhan remained circumspect about his religion in public, even as, in private, he was a deeply devout Catholic. More than one scholar has attributed McLuhan's insights into language and media to his mystical-infused traditional Catholicism and a vision for how electronic media would usher humanity into the body of Christ. In a mysterious way that I think we can appreciate, but perhaps not on the same level as McLuhan, the University of Wisconsin, of all places, helped bring Marshall McLuhan into the Catholic Church's magisterium. So I start with the story of Marshall McLuhan to illustrate that there is much unexplored territory at the intersection of UW and religion, swaths of historical material and memory that are rich, interesting, and often odd. The conversion of one famous academic may seem slight, but it fits into a larger pattern that awaits further definition. And so I'm here today to talk about a few of the fruits of the labor we've undertaken in the past three years, researching what we've called the religious and spiritual history of the University of Wisconsin. This is built on the work of many previous historians of the university and of the distinguished religious organizations in this city, some of whom have histories that are more than a century old. Suffice to say, this presentation is selective and incomplete. There are entire themes of the story that are just not present simply due to time. And I'd be delighted to discuss more in Q&A or after. Uh, really just wanting to understand what's on people's minds when you come to this topic. Now, when I mention this research topic, many people often ask, but does UW have a religious history? And they say it skeptically. Um, I've now developed an answer that there are many ways to consider what is meant by UW's religious history. And each answer can add depth to our appreciation of the university's meaning and legacy. So one way is to focus on the individuals who made up UW, and to interrogate their religious commitments, to ask how this dimension affected the life of the institution and how the institution shaped their religious journeys. The story of Marshall McLuhan is one example. A second way is through the lens of religious organizations and their engagement with UW. You could focus on the oldest existing institutions, such as St. Paul's, which traces its roots to a home club started in 1883. Or you could explore the now defunct YMCA that dominated student campus life for nearly 70 years. And there are many more you could highlight. The Hillel Foundation, the major center for Jewish student life, or the Muslim Student Association, which has advocated for minority rights on campus since the 1960s. A third way is to center UW itself, the institution with the most power in this whole scene, albeit power that accrued over time. 
McLuhan's primary purpose for being in Madison, after all, was to teach at UW. And it was through his job, in part, that his life took the trajectory that it did. Now, these aren't the only ways to talk about religious history at UW. You could look at how different religious movements have swept through UW over the decades, or how social movements with strong religious components, like the civil rights movement or parts of the anti-war movement, were felt on campus. We don't have time today to cover more than just a fraction of all the possible ways to tell the story. But I'm confident in telling you that each of these lenses gives us an answer that, yes, UW has a religious history, and each one is in a different register. By interweaving a few of these stories in the next half hour, I want to establish three insights about religion at UW that will structure the rest of this talk. So instead of claiming an absolute side between secular and religious, UW has at least three important features that make it something else altogether. It is an institution shaped by non-sectarianism, a 19th century ideology that I will introduce to you. UW is a site of creative tensions between religious and public education, particularly as the university grew into a major R1 school. And UW is a school that has experienced unique and fluctuating religious influence. And that is in contrast to some of the ways that are popularly talked about when talking about UW and religion. Combine these insights will hopefully give us an orientation to some of the ways religion and spirituality has shaped UW. It's left for us today to make sense of what this history means. The reality we have today is that a plurality of students at UW now declare no religious affiliation at all. And I'll talk a little more about that later. For that reason, it is possibly more important now than ever to remind ourselves of the, re the role religious culture has played in the life of UW. At the same time, the issue of religious influence in public education, including higher education, has become, like so many other issues, polarized. I don't offer a solution to that polarization here, but I do offer a starting point. The first step may be admitting that there's a complicated history we're grappling with, one that doesn't fit neatly into simplistic depictions of religion in UW. So we begin at the beginning of UW. As most of you know, the University of Wisconsin was founded in 1848 as the state of Wisconsin's original public university. It was written into the state's constitution as the establishment of a state university at or near the seat of state government. The same article of Wisconsin's constitution also declared that no sectarian instruction shall be allowed in such a university. The phrase sectarian instruction is curious to our 21st century ears, but it was a common one in the 19th century. The definition of non-sectarian was bounded by the extremely Protestant culture that dominated Wisconsin at its founding. Non-sectarian assumed, for the most part, that the relevant religions would be variations of Protestants, Presbyterians, Baptists, and the like. The non-sectarian clause in the Constitution prohibited any religious test for employment or office, upheld the free exercise of religion, and forbade state support for religious organizations. But again, the term religion here often functioned around the boundaries of what was largely Protestantism. And this made sense in the context of the 1840s higher education landscape in Wisconsin, which was dominated by Protestant denominational schools. So just think of the other options that were founded in Wisconsin, in the territory of Wisconsin, and then the state leading up to the founding of UW. There's Neshota Mission, now Neshota House, which is an Episcopal seminary. There's Beloit College, which was founded by Congregationalists. There's Carroll College, which was founded by Presbyterians. And there's Lawrence College, which was founded by Methodists. UW had no interest in replicating or mimicking these institutions. In fact, direct competition with sectarian institutions was closer to UW's goal. But in 1848, the opposite of sectarian or denominational was not secular. UW's founding as a non-sectarian university was not intended to cultivate religious disinterest. And here's an example. In an early draft of the Wisconsin Constitution, the writer suggested something closer to secular, declaring that the public education in the state should contain no book of religious doctrine or belief. This was interpreted by the public as a ban on religious instruction of any kind. This language received severe pushback. In a hearing just a week later, the language was amended to the wording that was closer to the final version that you see here. The modification was intended precisely to preserve religious instruction rather than ban it. 
And evidence for this in UW's early history abounds. Early UW students were required to attend chapel. Most early buildings had chapels in them, including North and South Halls. Faculty hosted Bible studies. UW presidents delivered an annual sermon as part of graduation week. The curriculum of the school included required classes on religious philosophy and ethics, all taught from a non-sectarian Protestant perspective. The non-sectarian identity of the new school also came in two other forms worth mentioning. The first is in UW seal, which was intended as the first essentially branding of the university. John Lathrop, the university's first president, selected Newman Lumen as the motto. The Latin phrase means God is the light or God our light. Lathrop interpreted in even less particularistic terms as the divine within the universe, however manifested, is my light. The accompanying symbol designed by Lathrop himself gives credence to this very broad, generous interpretation. The open eye below rays of sunlight resembled the Christian symbol of the eye of providence. Though with this slide, it does look a little like the eye of Sauron, uh, which was not intended. Uh, the symbol has roots in the Renaissance era and stands for universal values of knowledge, enlightenment, and learning. So this is one example of the non-sectarianism. Uh, if this seal suggests that UW is positioning itself as non-sectarian, its selection of its first presidents made this clear in another way. They all had strong religious identities. After John Lathrop, who was a lay Presbyterian, and his brief successor, Henry Barnard, who was a Baptist educator, the line of presidents continued to reflect a commitment to non-sectarianism that no other school in Wisconsin could duplicate. John Whelan Sterling was a Princeton Seminary graduate and Presbyterian minister. After him was Paul Chadbourne, who held a degree from the Congregationalist Hartford Theological Seminary. John Twombly, after him, was a Methodist minister, and John Bascom, who started his presidency in 1874, was a lifelong Congregationalist with a degree from Andover Theological Seminary. Even so, the upshot of this non-sectarian religious leadership meant that from the start, UW's most significant public relations challenge was assuring outsiders that it was not what its critics claimed, which was a godless or atheistic educational institution. Now, on the face, the accusation of godless makes little sense. I hope I've conveyed that to you already. Uh, yet understood within the tensions between sectarian and non-sectarian education in Wisconsin, the charge makes more sense. Beyond a few Protestant theological assumptions, UW propounded no particular dogma. More to the point, UW's approach to education uh, implied that dogma was a waste of time. John Bascom repeatedly warned against the sectarian way of education. He argued that the purpose of schools was precisely not to, in his words, build up our faith as a castle, set it up, uh, set up our doctrines as its gates, and gather in whom we can as camp followers. Instead, he wanted an institution that was both under the authority of God, as he put it, but also a place of common ground that acknowledged no thought was safe from scrutiny. Articulating how this approach to education was not, in fact, anti-religious was a major part of Bascom's job as president and of UW's early challenge in grappling with its Protestant non-sectarian identity. So we move now to a related dimension of the story that helps to define UW's identity as neither secular nor religious. As the school grew into a research university after Bascom's tenure, it underwent significant growth and growing pains. It grew in size from less than 500 students in the 1880s to 10,000 when McLuhan was on campus, from just a handful of faculty to dozens and then hundreds. And these faculty were spread among a growing number of colleges and departments. The idea of majoring in a specific field of study had to be introduced to UW. When the school started in 1848, every student took the same classes in curriculum which included a course on evidences for God and religious ethics. By the year 1900, UW expanded to five separate colleges that oversaw more than a dozen schools, institutes, and stations, all of them claiming their own certificates and majors and courses. That course on evidences for God also was dropped around this period in the late 19th century. The UW became a model of a land-grant institution, meaning it both expanded its physical footprint to include tracts of land west of campus, and it grew in its emphasis on applied research and practical sciences, including and especially agriculture. In all this change, the religious culture of the university began to change as well. A school that was almost uniformly Protestant began to accept a handful of Catholic and Jewish students. 
The first Jewish faculty joined in the 1880s. By the 1920s, UW's student body was 20% Catholic and 10% Jewish. As the students diversified, the tension of holding to the original Protestant nonsectarianism grew stronger. We see in UW's history a prime example of the beginnings of Protestant displacement from a place of unchallenged cultural authority. And that displacement continued apace. You could say it even continues apace today. One early stress point could be seen in the transition between John Bascom, who represented an older ideal, and his successor, Thomas Chamberlain, a geologist whose name now adorns the hall that houses the physics department. In the late 1880s, Chamberlain worked to thin out the thick Protestant culture of the school. The period was full of religious tension, and I can't get into the details here, but one indication from Chamberlain was his refusal as president to pray publicly or read the Bible in public. And this was in great contrast to Bascom, who did that frequently. Chamberlain also desired to eliminate re religious instruction from the curriculum, which he also did during his tenure. But Chamberlain did encourage moral instruction at UW based on beliefs, as he talked about it, under certain conditions, namely if it was outsourced to churches. And Chamberlain's views worked themselves out in the life of UW in at least two ways. One was the growth of religious organizations around the boundaries of campus. We sit in a very distant example of that here today, um, a descendant from the initial calls by late 19th century UW leaders seeking to outsource religious moral instruction. More prominent than Upper House in this history are the older organizations on campus. Across the street is St. Paul's and Press House and Calvary Lutheran Chapel. Down the street is St. Francis and Luther Memorial and The Crossing, among many others. And Hillel is a block that way. Later university leaders, like Charles Van Eyce, made this call more explicit. A common argument by UW leadership at this time was that religious bodies, denominations, and those colleges should dispense with education altogether and instead commit those same resources to campus ministries at public universities like UW or to causes like missions work and alleviating social ills. Leaders like Chamberlain and Van Eyce conceived of separate spheres of responsibility for public and religious education but they just simply assumed that these entities would work together in tandem. Such was the uncritical assumption of Protestant domination in education and religion for these generations of leaders. A second consequence of the Chamberlain era's changes was planting further seeds laid first by Bascom of what would become the Wisconsin idea, given full life by Charles Van Eyce and his famous call to make the boundaries of the university the boundaries of the state. At the time, the Wisconsin idea was an idea that bridged the religious understandings of Bascom, who saw the university's role as ushering in the kingdom of God, and he would talk about that frequently, and Chamberlain's more secular notion of the purpose of the university to the state. Van Heys was certain that the Wisconsin idea could not be entirely separated from religion. There was just too much overlap. The vision of a university extending justice and solving social problems resembled too closely late 19th century Christian understandings of the kingdom of God. Van Eyce himself, in a public lecture in 1913, explained that the purpose of the Wisconsin idea is the Wisconsin reply to the man who said to Jesus nearly 2,000 years ago, who is my neighbor? We'll leave the unpacking of what exactly Van Eyce meant by that for another time. But here it's important to note his preference for biblical Christian metaphors to make the case for the Wisconsin idea's importance. While today the Wisconsin idea is invoked in ways that don't necessarily call to mind the ethics of Jesus, it did for many previous generations of Wisconsinites and possibly could for many Wisconsinites today if their imaginations were stirred in that direction. But as UW continued to grow diverse in the 20th century across all types of categories, religiously, ethnically, and internationally, particularly here at the university, its Protestant influences were shed to meet a new public. So these previous two episodes fit into a final insight that UW's relationship to religion is one of nonlinear progression. There's no fixed direction or inevitability. Whenever we talk about UW, some version of history is implicit in what we say. It's the historian's role to make it explicit, and the process uh, hopefully will make it truer to the historical record. The implicit ways many treat UW's religious history are laid here on the slide. One way is as flat, basically saying as a public university, UW has always been secular. There's nothing to see here. Another is as a decline story. 
UW was religious at one point, but now not so much. A third version, heard sometimes from Protestants in particular, is essentially nostalgic. UW was more religious in the past, and it can return to that state again. These versions of history are implicit precisely because they are rarely uttered or made explicit. They come through embedded critiques of campus culture, the politics of higher education, the politics of Wisconsin. To say it again, all of these topics and views have implicit histories attached to them. You just have to know where to look. So what I want to convey here is that, in my view, none of the implicit histories I've listed here, flat, decline, nostalgic, none of them are really borne by the weight of the historical evidence. Not in any simple way, at least. Instead, the real shape is less poetic. It's nonlinear. Uh, that's my word. Uh, with periods of intense religious engagement and influence and periods of alienation and declining influence, all happening in a complex set of factors and a changing understanding of what is even meant by religion in the first place. Now, this is a perhaps frustratingly dense insight, but one that makes sense of a few different pieces of the history that I want to walk you through to show that it's very hard to stick to one of these more uh, simplistic ways of thinking of the history. So one piece of data is the changing demographics of student religious identification at UW. In this table, I collated some of the voluntary surveys of students issued over the early and mid 20th century, and then again, the campus climate surveys of 2016 and 2021. The shift is striking. In 1900, 99% of students identified as Christian, either Protestant or Catholic. In 2021, the number is 34%. What made the difference? In broad strokes, 38% of students now identify with no religious tradition, while another 17% identify as multi-faith or other. These two make up a majority of the student body today, which represents a pluralism on religion the university could not and never did foresee. More to the point, this data on its own could inform a pretty clear-cut decline narrative. Uh, the number of Protestants declines every time you take the poll. It seems pretty clear. If there's another way to spin the same number, so I'll, I'll just give it a shot. Doing some back of the envelope math, as a gross number, UW in the last 40 years has likely graduated more students than at any other period who have careers working for religious organizations or nonprofit organizations with religious commitments or businesses with stated religious values. Of course, as a share of students, the number has undoubtedly gone down over time, just given these demographic realities. But UW's extensive growth over the decades can tell a different story if you want to tell that story. And now let's move on to the second piece. Compare this demographic data with another piece of evidence, the story of UW's university hymn. Was anyone aware there was a university hymn? Um, until sometime in the 1960s, UW had an official hymn. Here's a version from a 1962 commencement program. Um, I'm guessing since no one knew it, no one sung it. I'm still curious about what it sounds like. I've never heard how it actually sounds. It used to accompany every official gathering, a major official gathering, every commencement, every building dedication. It's just hard to imagine today. The words are pretty anodyne. The sentiment is Protestant, but not offensively so. Yet the interesting thing to me is not that until the 1960s, UW had a hymn. This would fit into a pretty simple decline narrative of increasing secularization over time. Rather, it's that the hymn, when it was eliminated in the 1960s, was only about 40 or so years old. It was introduced in the 1920s, at a time of great religious fervor and controversy across the country. The fundamentalist movement was in full swing, with UW and its president at the time, someone named Edward Burge, in the spotlight of anti-evolution protests. Student religiosity increased after World War I for a variety of reasons, and especially in embracing social gospel ethics. The university itself codified a new era of sponsoring religious gatherings. It hosted a large annual Religious Awareness Week on campus, and an official University Religious Council was formed, which also lasted for about 40 years until the 1960s. These and many other factors helped to explain why the introduction of a hymn to the official life of UW made sense at the time in the 1920s, and also why it didn't before, say, in the 19th century. A third and final piece of evidence pointing to a nonlinear way to think about UW's religious development is the geographical drift of campus-based churches and ministries toward UW. 
This story does not fit in easily with the other two. Where the student data indicates ceaseless secularization over time, the hymn implies bouts of religiosity that spike and drop depending on outside factors. The geographical story of campus-based religious organization would, in isolation, tell a story that uh, UW has increasingly attracted more and more religious communities to campus. So this is sort of an alternate way to think of the history. So I mentioned before that university officials led by Charles Van Eyes encouraged churches in particular to move closer to campus and become more influential in the life of the university. He and others made that call in light of the reality that can be seen in this 1896 student handbook issued to every incoming freshman and published by the YMCA. On the back flap is this hand-drawn map of Madison. The letters A through I on the top left of the map signaled houses of worship in Madison, from congregational to Catholic to Unitarian to Jewish. But if you just take a note of their general location, most are nearly half a mile away from campus, much closer to the square than to UW. So this is the state all the way back in 1896. Let's fast forward to 1970, and the landscape has changed dramatically in at least two ways. So this is a map from the University of Religious Workers, an organization that came into existence after 1896. And this is a map given in a student handbook of right around campus. The proximity of these churches and places of worship has diminished greatly, with more than a dozen closer than any were in 1896. Likewise, there is far more diversity in this list of places. There are the historic Protestant churches. They remain present, but not dominant. The Hillel Foundation, founded in 1924, becomes the center of Jewish life on campus. Groups without buildings include the Muslim Student Association and the Baha'i Club. Even within the Protestant fold, the listing of evangelical ministries without buildings on the bottom right, not on the map, including Badger Christian Fellowship, which was part of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, and Campus Crusade for Christ, these presage a new era in the 1970s and 1980s when they would come to outpace in size the historic Protestant churches on campus. Overall, the story of religious organizations in UW has been of increasing presence on campus, more diversity, more activity over time, even as, even as they have moved out of the center of UW's institutional life. This is taken from the UW website today. There are now more than 60 spiritual or religious registered student organizations. And they illustrate how there has been an explosion of organizations and club representing dozens of traditions not present earlier in UW's history. Most actually meet on campus or very nearby, while others meet in spaces like Upper House or other churches and elsewhere in close proximity. The story of the close proximity, both literally and figuratively, of the UW to religious organizations also continues to animate the UW leadership in the 21st century. So here is the late Rebecca Blank in 2016 explaining the importance of churches to providing moral frameworks in today's discussions alongside those used at the university. She said here in an interview, interview to Duke University, the church's role in talking about other frameworks, moral frameworks, which can, people can bring to their behavior in market society is deeply important, partly because there are almost no other voices in that arena. You can see here echoes of the 19th century idea of partnership between religious and public education for the purposes of broadening the conversation. So have I convinced you that there is a nonlinear path to UW's religious history? Possibly not, but hopefully you get a sense that how we tell the story of religion at UW really does matter. So what is the implicit assumption you carry around about this history? And what are other stories we can tell? Here then I return to my three proposed insights. UW was founded as non-sectarian. Religion has been a constant source of creative tension in the heart of UW's defining eras. And religious influence has fluctuated in a nonlinear pattern in the 175 year life of the university. As we wrap up, here's a picture of a young Helen C. White, the towering professor of literature and poetry for whom the undergraduate library is now named. In many ways, Helen White and Marshall McLuhan shared little beyond a Catholic faith and an interest in English literature when they first met in 1936 here in Madison. He was a 26-year-old Canadian man, and she was a 40-year-old woman from New Haven, Connecticut. He was on his way through Madison while pursuing a PhD at Oxford, 
She got her PhD at UW. He was a one-year graduate teaching assistant. She was on UW's faculty for 48 years. He was just a couple years away from meeting his wife and returning to Canada. She was a lifelong bachelorette with the nickname The Purple Goddess. And that's because she wore purple every day of her life. Um, yet for all their differences, McLuhan and White shared, by the end of his year in Madison, devotion to the Roman Catholic Church. Albeit this was one that McLuhan came to very recently, and one that she had nurtured since birth. McLuhan passed through the UW English Department at a unique time when White was a rising star at UW. She was the unofficial leader of a vibrant Catholic network of faculty on campus that would count more than 100 strong a decade later. McLuhan worked with White during his year at UW, and she became a letter writer for him in the following years. His correspondence while in Madison is sparse, so we don't know for certain if White had a decisive hand in McLuhan's conversion to Catholicism. But it is likely. White was a close ally of Father Cuchera, the priest who received McLuhan into the Catholic Church over at St. Paul's. She was also deeply committed to the mentorship of young Catholics on campus. And there's also the intriguing clue that among McLuhan's reading list for 1936 to 37, he kept a a uh, close diary of what he read, are a number of books in White's bailiwick, Victorian-era Christian mystics. One can only guess who recommended them to McLuhan during his year in Madison. Whatever the case, in McLuhan and White, we have examples of the brief and the lasting in the drama of religion at UW. McLuhan's religion took a new trajectory after his time at UW, while White's sustained presence on campus helped shape UW itself. Both owed their biographies in small and large ways to the university, to the institution that gave them reasons to be in Madison and structured the pursuit of knowledge and meaning in both their lives. So I'll end with this quote by Helen White in one of her most famous books, A Study of the Mystic, William Blake. In this work, White describes art and religion as two of the most human activities, the activity of humanity trying to extend itself, transcend itself. The inclusive and means that this noble pursuit is not exclusive to religious people, but that religion in various manifestations supports the enduring and perennial human quest to transcend itself. In UW's history, this impulse may be found in those who study, teach, and lead the university, in those religious organizations that serve the community, and in the university itself. It might be entailed, you could argue, in the school's own mission statement which claims knowledge, wisdom, and values as what the university seeks to discover, examine critically, preserve, and transmit. For those inspired by that noble vision of the University of Wisconsin, being a place where humanity is trying to transcend itself, we can take heart. We stand on the shoulders of many who came before us. So there is a long history to tap into here, and one that still has much to explore and reveal. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, for distilling all of that information for us. Appreciate it. Okay, I would like to um, welcome to the stage um, one who is going to tell us more about this Spirit in Stone audio tour, um, and one who is responsible for its beginnings, and one who has been a faithful champion of the gospel on this campus for many years. As mentioned, um, a longtime InterVarsity grad and faculty staff worker, and also our foundation board member. Please welcome John Dahl. Thank you, Becca. Um, I have five minutes, which if you do the math, that's half a TED Talk. So this is going to be kind of fast. So um, I'm a self-described campus rat. I work for InterVarsity, and I've learned how to do staff work by uh, just meeting students and faculty wherever I could find them, which meant going into all the buildings on campus and meeting people, meeting them where I could. I've been in every coffee shop on the Isthmus numerous times. I've spent way much more money on coffee than I ever should have. Uh, I, I suffer from caffeine poisoning by the time I get to mid-October every year. But I love my job. I absolutely love my job. The origin story for where this tour came from uh, begins in several places, and I'll try to do this fairly quickly and easily. One of them is by a quote by a guy named Charles Habib Malik, 
who was a UN ambassador, um, who in the 40s and 50s uh, famously said, more potently than by any other means, if you want to change the world, change the university. More potently than by any other means, if you want to change the world, change the university. And so people like me, if you ask me, how do you change the university? I would say you go into all the campus buildings and you meet with grad students and faculty, and that's where you start. And there's something to that. Uh, there is something about saying, if we're going to change the forest, you start with the trees. Got to get an amen? Yeah, right. And there's a lot of great work to be done, and that's mostly what I do on an everyday basis, is, is go into buildings, drink coffee, and meet with people. Some of them have been chancellors. I'll get to them in a minute. What I found, though, over time, is that you don't actually change institutions by seeing people come to Jesus. No matter how many people we reach, no matter how many conversions we see, the institution itself may or may not change. And that was a very hard thing for me to come to realize after a period of time. There's been great work done by a number of, of sociologists over time who talk about how institutions actually change. But my fundamental thing about doing evangelism as a means of changing university didn't hold. So what does hold? And this is where a guy enters the picture by the name of Vern Weizsäck. And there's no way I'm going to do this talk without mentioning that guy because he's one of the best mentors I ever had. He did his uh, PhD at the University of Chicago in sociology. And Vern, more than anybody else, helped me to understand UW as an institution. What came out of my conversations with grad students and with faculty and people like Vern was an axiom that I've, I, I just take this to be really evident. And that is you cannot reach people with the gospel unless you love them. You can't reach people unless you love them. Similarly, I think it's also true, you cannot reach an institution until you learn how to love it. And for me, trying to figure out how do I love UW, which does amazing things, amazing work, amazing knowledge production, research, it's, it's an amazing institution. But people also get burned and hurt and beat up in that place. And early on, I had a chip on my shoulder with respect to the university and realized I am having a hard time learning how to love this place. And so what happened was I, uh, just native curiosity, wanted to know what these people that all these buildings are named after, you know, Chamberlain, Bascom, Burge, who were these people? Who were the people that formed this institution? And how is that institution forming the people that I'm working with on a day-to-day -day basis? So let me just tell you one story that shows up in the tour, and I have one minute and 10 seconds to tell it. Edward Burge was a botanist, and he was very good at what he did, but he was also someone that people around the university trusted, and he became chancellor. He did it over uh, two stints. This is back in the 20s, 30s, 40s, somewhere back there. There was also the time that William Jennings Bryan was, was barnstorming the United States. It was the fundamentalist, modernist split, all that kind of thing, and he was against evolution, if you remember the Scopes Monkey Trial. He came to campus, spoke over there at the university, and Edward Burge, the son of a pastor, said, I haven't heard, and listened to Burge, said, I haven't heard anybody give that kind of a sermon since I was a kid. Somebody picked up on that and reported it to William Jennings Bryan, who then accused Burge of being an atheist. This is all, by the way, found in the first two volumes of UW's history by Carson Sinekurdy, and I encourage you to read all four volumes, but the first two are the best. And I'm almost out of time. Anyway, reported that it was he was an atheist. The um, the local papers picked up on this, and uh, Burge's uh, barber had a shop up on State Street, and he somebody read to him what somebody that William Jane and Brian called his his customer, his friend, an atheist. They both went to First Congregational Church. Uh, over here on uh, just off the university. And on hearing that his friend had been called an atheist, he said, Ed Burge, an atheist? He's been taking a nap in the same pew for the last 25 years <laughs> at First Congo. Ed Burge, an atheist? Hell. Now, that's the kind of story that needs to be told to every generation and to grad students in particular when they come through to realize that every one of these buildings has a story. The people that they're named after are human beings, and they all have a story, and Ed Burge had a story. He was not an evangelical, 
but he was certainly amenable and, and open. And he was a Sunday school teacher at First Congo. He's the kind of person that you would hold up to grad students and to say, this is the per- kind of person you need to look into because this is a person who was shaped by this place as you were being shaped as well. That's where this tour comes from, is just walking this campus, looking at all the buildings and trying to unearth those stories. Thank you. Thank you, John. As a former student at UW-Madison, I do recommend the tour. It gives a lot of depth and meaning to places that we just daily, casually walk by. So I would very much recommend that. Okay, and now I would like to introduce um, the man who is responsible for the documentary we are about to view, and probably one of the most patient and humble of producers. He went through so many edits and so much feedback to make this documentary possible. Former senior staff member of InterVarsity and former director of communications at InterVarsity for over 40 years. Please welcome Scott Wilson. Of the first time I heard John and Dan talk about the history, the spiritual history of the UW, I hope I didn't literally drop my jaw and gawk at you, but that's certainly the way I felt. I'd probably walked up Bascom Hill a hundred times, and never had I thought about the spiritual implications of the people and the buildings around me. Um, I'm actually a little embarrassed by that now. 45 years living in Madison, a career in student ministry, and not much of an idea at all about the spiritual history of the University of Wisconsin. Well, you already know from the program tonight that Upper House and fulfilling the Templeton Foundation grant decided to do three kinds of projects to tell a little bit of that history. And I think I might argue it would be fair to say that they get shorter and smaller and less sophisticated as you go. And the video is at the end that's kind of short. You'll hear some the same stories again. Um, the video was in te- originally intended to be 10 minutes long. The version you'll see in a moment is almost twice that. Still, it's much, much shorter than what <laughs> Dan and John have done. It obviously leaves out a lot. But I think it also tells enough of the story to an audience, particularly an unsuspecting audience like I was, to have a little bit of a wow experience in watching. The names, the faces, the stories have had a deep impact on me. I'll never again walk up Bascom Hill without thinking about the context that I'm in, in the implications of that, of the meaning of being in that place. I, 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 th- I hope that I actually have learned a lesson about that and never visit any place without thinking a little bit about the spiritual context of the environment I'm in and what I can learn from that. I hope I learn to ask questions about the spiritual history of all the places I go. The history of the UW is certainly exceedingly complex. It's changing. It's filled with all sorts of diversity. Lots of the pieces of the history don't match my own thinking about theological or social you know, issues, but they do enrich my life. And they help bring depth to my own experience and my own beliefs by helping them be refined. The history lands me in the community in which I live. The history reminds me that I'm not alone and never have been in my faith journey. And the history demonstrates God's faithfulness over a very long period of time. I'm hoping that those who watch the video 
have a little bit of the same experience that I've had in thinking about it and working on it. The last thing I'll say is that as, before we run the video, is it's been both a privilege and a pleasure to work on this project with the staff at Upper House. Thank you. College, a time to increase academic knowledge, to prepare for a career, and to explore meaning. At the University of Wisconsin-Madison, faith has had an important role in that exploration. What might be surprising to most who experience campus life now is there have always been faculty, staff, and administrators with deep faith commitments whose spirituality has played a role in shaping that exploration of meaning. When UW was founded in 1848, religion was an essential part of instruction and culture. Early on, students were required to take a course in Christian apologetics and attend chapel. In 1849, 20 students, all men, began to meet for classes at the Madison Female Academy because no university buildings existed at the time. Early buildings and dorms had their own chapels and daily attendance was required. Attendance became voluntary about 30 years after UW's founding. The chapels themselves disappeared altogether by the end of the century, but a plaque on South Hall reflects that religious influence with an enduring reference to the Bible for the mission of the school. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. A quote from the Gospel of John. John Bascom, the university's sixth president, and namesake for that beautiful hill that gives you an incredible calf workout, was a huge influence on the UW's intellectual, social, and religious culture. A trained minister as well as professor, Bascom came to the UW in 1874 with advanced degrees from Andover Theological Seminary and Williams College. When he arrived in Wisconsin, he was met with pressing questions about the university's direction, including the role religion would play in its curriculum. Like today, Many citizens voiced their concern that the university was a godless and atheistic institution, while others worried that a religious person like Bascom would compromise the impartiality of the school's mission as a public university. Bascom's personal faith was well known. During his time in Madison, he regularly attended First Congregational Church, where he also taught classes. But Bascom also understood that a state university should not be tied to a single denominational perspective. Though diversity was seen only within a Christian context, Bascom inspired later UW leaders to invite several denominations to purchase properties close to campus and launch student churches. The construction of these worship spaces helped lay the foundation for the wide religious pluralism on today's campus. Many of the churches established adjacent to campus in the early 1900s, like Calvary Lutheran Chapel, St. Paul's Catholic Center, Press House, Luther Memorial Church, and the Episcopalian St. Francis House still exist. Bascom's approach was practical and demonstrated high regard for the role that religious faith can play in public life. Bascom believed that faith and social activism needed to walk hand in hand a reality that remains a vital part of UW's campus culture. He supported trade unions to remedy the negative effects of industrialization and urbanization. He supported women's rights and also the temperance movement. His academic writings demonstrate his rich weave of science, philosophy, and religion, a view included in his books with titles like Natural Theology and Science, Philosophy, and Religion. Bascom's outgoing baccalaureate sermon to the graduating class of 1887, titled A Christian State, articulated the university's mission in very Christian terms. The University of Wisconsin will be permanently great in the degree in which it understands the conditions of the prosperity and peace of the people and helps to provide them, in the degree in which it enters into the revelation of truth. The law of righteousness and the love of man, all gathered up and held firm in the constitution of the human soul, and the counsel of God concerning it. Today, UW's website lists more than 50 registered religious or spiritual organizations. The University Religious Workers Professional Association brings together a diverse and interfaith group of campus religious leaders to discuss campus-related topics. 
Together, they represent far more diversity than Bascom would have imagined. In the mid-1800s, before John Bascom's 13-year tenure, John Muir was a UW student. Muir would later co-found the Sierra Club and was considered the father of the national parks. He was raised in a strict Protestant home and by age 16 had memorized most of the Bible. Muir is an early and notable example of a religious journey many students have taken during their university experience. He found a literal interpretation of the Bible at odds with his courses in classic literature, geology, and botany, and that led him to adopt a faith less tied to organized religion, but more rooted in Christian spirituality. John Muir's view of God's character also changed during his experience at UW. He came to view God as loving rather than harsh and punishing. As he wrote in his journal in 1873, God's love covers all the earth as the sky covers it, and this love his voice is heard by all who have ears to hear. Today, you can find Muir Knoll on UW campus, which was dedicated in 1918 to recognize his impact. Few scientists were as respected in their time as Thomas Trowder Chamberlain, a geologist who served as UW's president from 1887 to 1892. Like Bascom and Muir, Chamberlain's beginnings were humble and religiously conservative, being the son of a Methodist traveling preacher. As a scholar, Chamberlain's mapping of the geology of Wisconsin led to national recognition for his scientific acumen and his terminology for glacial stages in North America is still in use. As a student and young scientist, Chamberlain's faith was evident. He directed a church choir and taught Sunday school classes on the relationship between science and religion. But in due course, Chamberlain's religious commitments changed. Through his research, he came to regard the cosmos as the realm of truth and the biblical creation story a glory of the past. In 1893, he wrote, the curtains of the heavens have been folded up and laid away as the garments of our children, as things loved but outgrown. The richest imagery of all past literature has lost its power, save as a glory of the past. And this simply because it was not true. The heavens are not as they were imagined. The beauty of thought does not make it true. The loveliness of thought does not make it immortal. Only the truth is enduring. Chamberlain's journey away from traditional religion to a spiritual appreciation of the cosmos is not uncommon in today's university. Does science negate faith, or can the pair exist in harmony? Edward Burge, a prominent UW professor and president, believed the latter, that science and faith could live in harmony. For most of his 50 years at the university, he attended and taught classes at Madison's first congregational church. While at the university, he assembled a cross-disciplinary team of scientists and developed the new science of limnology, the study of lakes. Because of his historic work, Lake Mendota would eventually be nicknamed the most studied lake in the world. Burge's administrative leadership was highly regarded. During his second appointment as UW's president, he became a lightning rod in the national anti-evolution movement. In 1921, politician William Jennings Bryan made UW-Madison a stop on one of his speaking tours. At the Red Gym, he led a rally of thousands of students and charged that, under Burge's presidency, the teaching of evolution in UW classrooms was leading to the downfall of Christian civilization. In the month that followed, Burge took on Jennings and the two exchange newspaper op-eds. Burge insisted that biological evolution and Christianity need not be in tension. In one op-ed, he wrote, I have taken part in the religious and the scientific activities of the world in which I have lived, with no thought of conflict or even division between them. I have never found it necessary to justify religion to science or to excuse science to religion. I have accepted both as equally divine revelations, and both are equally wrought into the constitution of the world. One hundred years have passed since the historic debate. Today, Burge Hall's location near the top of Bascom Hill and the heart of campus bears witness to the enduring legacy of the many Christian faculty and students negotiating the relationship between faith and science. Another professor with very public faith was Helen C. White, a devout Catholic and woman of firsts. In UW's College of Letters and Science, White is thought to be the first woman to earn a PhD the first woman to be a full professor, and later the first woman to chair the UW English department. 
She was also a champion for her students and an activist for issues of social justice and gender justice on campus. For example, she advocated for admission of women to the UW University Club and later for admission of black faculty and students who were barred from the premises. White was a respected scholar of Christian mystics and religious 16th century British literature. She was also an accomplished novelist. Her book, A Watch in the Night, was runner-up for the 1934 Pulitzer Prize. Its main character was a Franciscan monk dealing with church politics and themes of redemption, ambition, and service. A parishioner of St. Paul's Catholic Church until her death in 1967, White taught at the UW for 48 years. Across her life, she received many awards, including the University of Notre Dame Littare Medal for a life devoted to the things of the mind and the spirit as an outstanding Catholic layperson. John W. Alexander, chair of UW's Geography Department in Science Hall, was another professor who expressed deep Christian faith. Among his academic writing, accomplishments, and passions, he led a weekly meeting with faculty to discuss Christianity. It was at that time that John established this lunch Bible study for faculty that met in the social science building on the ground floor right near the Campanile and met on um, uh, every Friday noon. Uh, and uh, uh, the thing I remember the most was going the Book of Acts and we'd go around the room and read scripture. And uh, there would be discussion, open discussion, sometimes very hostile to the gospel, sometimes very cynical, sometimes just curious. So uh, lots of people, most of the people were just curious and some people downright interested. Alexander left UW in 1964 to become president of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship USA, a national parachurch ministry that continues to serve student and faculty fellowship groups on college campuses nationwide. Christian faculty have continued to call Science Hall home. Professor Calvin DeWitt, known to many as the modern day father of Christian environmentalism, trained multiple generations of wetland biologists who now work around the globe to preserve, steward, and promote at-risk biospheres. He also published on issues of ecology and stewardship from a Christian perspective for more than 40 years until his retirement in 2011. DeWitt brings together scientific knowledge with the idea of God as creator to help people appreciate the complexity of nature. I believe that the key is to be able to look at the creation through the eyes of its creator. Uh, so, behold the earth through the eye of its maker has been my basic theme all through life, but I've only been able to articulate that in the last few years. Uh, and uh, that's key because you don't discuss whether it's evolution or creation anymore. You don't. Uh, you ask, what, how does God see it? Uh, and. Uh, uh, that makes all the difference. And I've lived my life that way, but I didn't know for sure how to articulate that. Mary Lou Daniel taught and researched for decades at UW and was open about her personal faith. I was blessed by being in a department that lets you keep your door open and isn't bothered by that and knows what's on other people's bookshelves. I would get students that weren't my student knocking at my door and saying, uh, Professor so-and-so sent me over because I need to consult something in the Bible. Because I had Spanish and Portuguese and English Bibles and so on, and we'd give them away and uh, let people borrow them and the like. And so uh, I was able for a number of years during my, my years here on the faculty to have uh, Portuguese language Bible studies in my office in which any students that wanted to come as long as the office would hold them you know could come and we at noon would study whatever they wanted to in the Bible it's uh, interesting how much uh, angst sometimes is is in the minds of younger people 
uh, weighed down by the cares of, uh, of a world they didn't make. Today, a wide range of UW professors maintain deep religious faith, many of them in traditions other than Christianity. The manner in which they integrate their beliefs and practices with their work is as diverse as their convictions and perspectives. And yet, despite their presence, the place of faith at the UW is often misunderstood. There's an air I have felt, and, and I don't think I'm the only one, not of overt hostility, but of a profound and studied indifference. That is, yeah, we know there's this thing called re religion, and we know that people might be involved with it. Indeed, we know that there are churches lining the campus. Um, but it's not something really of great interest or moment. That sense of, of a place that religion might play on campus is, is somewhat lacking here. And, and I think Wisconsin actually has something of a reputation for that. Even so, strands of religion appear in unexpected ways. The Humanities Building is named after historian George L. Mossy, a Jewish emigre who lost most of his family in the Holocaust and eventually spent 30 years at the UW as a beloved teacher and mentor. Massey's early career was studying the history of religion and his numerous books have shaped scholars of both religion and history for generations. Today, the Humanities Building houses the Massey Program in History and the Center for Jewish Studies. It also houses the Center for Religion and Global Citizenry. In the courtyard of the Massey Building is the intricate Children of Abraham sculpture with the name of the biblical patriarch Abraham lettered in Arabic, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. It symbolizes the braided histories of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and the university's hope for diverse representation of faiths across campus. Administrators, campus ministers, and faculty continue to pursue truth and contribute to our common life and society. Their work is advancing in important fields like genetics, law, climate change, healthcare, and more. While the community may be unaware of the deep spiritual themes that undergird the history of their university, the faculty named in this video and the buildings with their names bear witness to this rich spiritual legacy. Faith is a vibrant factor that inspires the individual and shapes culture. If faith calls for creativity, bears activism, and in champions hope. It is an idea worthy of inquiry, the type of fearless inquiry that has fueled the pursuit of knowledge, goodness, justice, and beauty at the UW since its founding. Whatever may be the limitations that trammel inquiry elsewhere, we believe the great state University of Wisconsin should ever encourage that continual and fearless sifting and winnowing by which alone the truth can be found. Okay, um, thank you, Scott. Um, really thank wonderful you. to wonderful to see that. Um, I'm going to ask a, a question of each of you, and I'm going to ask you to kind of be somewhat succinct in the response because I want to get to our audience here, and we're running a little short on time, but I'm really curious about some things. Um, Scott, I want to start with you. I wonder um, if you could just. You said your mouth almost dropped when you spoke to Dan and John for the first time and, and kind of learned the, the rich history of this place. I wonder if you could share a, a key insight or something that just really surprised you about the history. You sat through lots of interviews. I mean, one of the things that was true is we interviewed lots of individuals. A few showed up uh, in, the, in the actual documentary, um, but there were so many minutes and hours of learning. Do you have one key insight about this place? Probably the sheer quantity of, of faith exp expressions among staff, 
administrators, you know, professors at the university. I grew up in university under Dr. Alexander, so I was aware of that. But it just spread. The more, the more I read, the more I learned from these guys. Like, wow, the University of Wisconsin faith has played a key role. Good. Thank you. John, a question for you. And I had multiple questions for you, and you addressed them all in your little um, preamble. So, um, but I wonder, John, if you could share a, a spot that you'd like to highlight um, to our guests here tonight on the tour that just feels like hallowed ground to you. When you, when you visit this place, uh, a particular building or a plaque or something, is there, is there one that just stands out that the ground really does feel holy? Yeah, that's, a, that's a good question, John. The whole place, uh, the whole university in some respects, um, I mean, we think of it as a secular institution and it is, but if you're, uh, your theological tradition is sufficiently small or reformed, you know, the idea that, that, that uh, Jesus is Lord over everything, including this place, that there isn't one square inch of this university that somehow doesn't fall underneath his lordship. But given, given that, um, the, the plaque that you could hear Dan reading from up on top of Bascom Hill, there's a, it's a limestone first, first floor right as you come into the, into the main doors of the building, that plaque has got a really rich, deep history, which I don't have time to explain. Um, but I will tell you one short story. Can I do that? Short one? Okay. So if, if you go on the tour with me, you get to hear this stuff. On the other side of the wall is a chancellor's office. And so Becky Blank, the most recent um, person who was in there prior to Jennifer Manukin now. And so John Wiley, former chancellor, uh, would go to, for his first, first year as chancellor, went to a, um, uh, a gathering of, of uh, provosts and university presidents from around the country. And there was stand up, say your name, where you're from, all that kind of thing, sit down. So people were doing that, stand up, sit, introduce themselves, sit down. John Wiley stands up, says John Wiley, University of Wisconsin Chancellor. is sitting down and people start to clap. They applaud him. And he's looking around the room, he's like, what is that all about? And if you understand what was on the plaque on the opposite side of his wall, you, would, uh, you could understand this. But that plaque is about academic freedom. It cemented the idea of academic freedom in this country. It started here. And so when John Wiley introduced himself, other people around the country knew that the University of Wisconsin cemented this idea of academic freedom. And him representing that, and his office being the opposite side of that wall, he had to have it explained to him from people from around the country. He didn't know it himself. And so he told me that story over a cup of coffee. And I thought, that is a great story. So. <laughs> great. That's great. Thank you, John. Yeah. Uh, Dan, question for you. Um, can you give us a sense of where the university uh, today is supporting engagement with religion or just conversations uh, about, about religion? Yeah, um, there's a few ways to answer that. One just quick one is there's a religious studies program at UW that supports faculty from across the university who teach somehow, classes that somehow have a relationship to religion. Um, there's also many particular faculty in different departments that study religion in various ways and publish on it um, and, and teach classes in it as well. Um, another way to think about it is um, there are interesting projects that the UW actually supports that have One of them is um, at the Center for Healthy Minds, if, if you all know where that is, and uh, uh, run by Richie Davidson. But they have something called the LOCA Initiative, which is an interfaith effort uh, around some, some climate change um, uh, science and, and issues particularly related to religion and science. So that's one funded by the university. Another is, uh, we have Ulrich Rosenhagen in the, uh, in the audience here. Another is the Center for Religion and Global Citizenry which comes out of an older project called the Lubar Institute that was run by uh, Chuck Cohen, who was in the, in the video. And that's been an ongoing effort to facilitate interfaith dialogue on campus as well. And then the third one I'll mention is if you go on to the UW website, you can actually look up um, uh, sort of spaces on campus where you can practice your religion. This is particularly for Muslim students who need places to pray um, on campus during the day. They're called, they're called meditation spaces, and that's a, a, 
a way that the university can sort of have a space but not be super religious about what that space does, pretty general term. Um, but there are dozens of those on campus. And so there are actually places in all these, many of these buildings that are really small, but they're dedicated to allowing students to practice um, their religion uh, around campus. And that's been an effort to accommodate the, the, growing, the growing pluralism on campus and the different ways people worship um, on campus. Great. Thanks, Dan. Okay, I think we're ready for questions uh, from our guests. Uh, Becca has a microphone, and we'd love to hear your question. Um, so, uh, one of the joys of my job is I get to interact with a lot of different people. And yesterday I had lunch with, a, a, a about, uh, eight, uh, people who would describe themselves as atheists and they're actually quite crusty about their atheism. And I really enjoy these guys. So they know what I do and they find me very, very curious, you know? And so when I describe projects like this, they are full of questions. Really? I had no idea. So I, I've actually given a version of this tour in a verbal way without, because we haven't been able to go up Bascom Hill and back. But they're like, I had no idea. I mean, they're actually genuinely curious. And part of it is because we have a relationship and they trust me. But they're genuinely interested in, in the history. What they're really suspicious of is the nostalgic piece that uh, Dan brought up. And that is, there's no going back to some sort of Protestant uh, hegemony over the campus. That they're very suspicious of. But people like me doing the kind of work I do, yeah, they're very curious. Thank you, uh, Kirk Moreland. Uh, questions for Dan. First one I think is maybe a yes or no. Maybe a quick answer. Has the University of Wisconsin ever had, or does it now have, I think so, not, a university chaplain? It did, um, really early on. Uh, during the Civil War, it had a chaplain, um, and I think it was eliminated by 1870. Okay. Second question, um, interested in your um, up and down, nonlinear history of faith and religion here on a campus. I saw some highs, I saw some lows. Um, what did you see, if anything, that was associated with the mountaintops? What variables were in place? What factors did you notice anything that accompanied the mountaintops or the valleys? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I'll talk about one uh, mountaintop. If you mean by mountaintop, sort of increased religious identification and fervor on campus. Um, I'll take the 1950s, which I think is the most religious decade of UW's history. Um, again, that's far into the history, so there would be an expectation that the further back you go, the more religious. I think the 1950s are, are the most religious, and that's by a few measures. Um, one is in the country as a whole, um, church attendance in the, in the United States is way up. And so all across the board, there's more people attending churches, synagogues, um, uh, and other places of worship. Um, this is the big, this is sort of the height of the Cold War um, sense. This is the era of McCarthy. This is the era when it is very good to be identified with religion versus atheism in this broader Cold War. This is also also the era of uh, the concept of Judeo Christianity being sort of the premier way that um, particularly elites in America describe what's uniquely interesting and valuable about the Western culture. There's this Judeo Christian tradition. And that's a Judeo-Christian is intended to include not just Protestants but Catholics and Jews. Um, if you go to UW, if, if you if you could go back to UW in that decade, um, there is just uh, there's, it's hard to even know where you'd find the separation between church and state in some ways. There's obviously not an official church dictating things, but there is religious invocation. There's hymns being sung. There's religious invocations all over the place. 
Um, there are uh, pastors' conferences being hosted on campus. Um, there are, uh, you know, the YMCA I mentioned uh, briefly. The YMCA continues to help publish um, official university literature. Um, it'd be very hard for an outsider to understand where the difference is uh, between sort of where the religion ends and the university begins happens. So I think there's a lot of, you know, UW, it's hard to even give a talk like this because UW doesn't sit in an island. It's obviously entirely at the whims of the broader culture in terms of what students are coming in with and what is happening at the university. So it, it got swept up just like many universities did in articulating a Judeo-Christian anti-communism as the core of what it was offering society. Um, and that, that would be the sort of one of the peak, the, the, the most recent high point in religiosity on campus. Yeah, um, I need to voice a little bit of uneasiness here because I thought um, the spiritual history of UW Madison um, is more than than the history of a number of faculty, as important as they may be, um, and it's also a history um, that goes beyond the precedence um, of of 60 or more years ago. Um, I'm more interested to hear from you, what is the spirit of the university in the 1960s? Yeah, when this, when this was a place in turmoil. Yeah, what, what's, what's the, the spirit of the university in the 70s? Yeah, when um, the Vietnam War comes to an end. And Jimmy Carter is on my mind now because we know he's he's in hospice now. Yeah, the nineteen eighties, moral majority. So um, I want to hear more from you about what makes this um, a divine spirit present on campus, present in this institution. How can we wrap our minds around this? Yeah, I think there is more, more to tell beyond as important as that is for the founding of the university and to hear about Bascom and, and, and Helen C. White. And, and I mean, I'm delighted uh, that I saw my friend Bob Frickenberg uh, here on uh, in the documentary and to see Chuck, but Chuck, I think Chuck Cohen, I, I think um, he gave us a direction to, to continue thinking a little bit. Um, he said there is this, um, this ignorance or this um, kind of, um, yeah, ignorance towards religious issues or issues of spirituality he encountered throughout his career at, at UW. So with that in mind, or this as a backdrop, what makes this a spiritual place? What makes this, uh, or, or how can we think of the history of the divine spirit in this or at this institution? C can you talk a little bit more about that? Uh, I can I can hazard an answer, but um, I will say you know that the presentation was selective. I do have more thoughts on the sort of post World War II period, and particularly the post nineteen sixties period um, uh, in the in the essay I wrote. So I'll defer a, a bit to that. Um, uh, uh, but I'll say I just talked about the nineteen fifties and how that was a high point. The nineteen sixties are a much different story, and um, you know this is a broader. It's not just happening at UW. A broader trend of decline in in these numbers that um, I've I've cited, um, and a, and a sort of if you think of there's a, you know a fixed amount of religious energy in a given place, um, that energy is uh, and maybe you could say spiritual energy. That energy is redirected in the 1960s to causes that are not antithetical to religion at all but are embodied in more in cultural political stances. So the two I'll mention are the civil rights movement um, and the anti-war movement. And both of those come to define in a lot of ways, as a lot of us know, what UW spirit is in a lot of ways. These are movements toward justice. These are movements against oppression. 
Um, and many of the uh, organizations that uh, were largely religious in function in the 1950s, many of these churches become major players in the civil rights and anti-war protest movements in the 1960s and 1970s. They also, on an organizational level, tend to suffer for this. They tend to have declining numbers of attendees. Um, many of them shut down. Many of them merge because there's just uh, not enough resources to go around. I get into that uh, in the essay. Um, but that is one part of the story, and it's an interesting one that, that happens across the country at that time um, uh, that, uh, that, that UW is, is a big part of. The last thing I'll say is, um, uh, Ulrich, you and I know each other. I'm a sucker for numbers and sort of organizational charts. So part of this is just you're getting a historian who's interested in trying to map out some of the institutional and, um, and numbers history of this. I would also say uh, no one's done this before. So part of what you have to do when you're trying to sort of tread new ground is you have to create a framework within which to ask deeper questions um, that might even produce the most interesting answers along a whole range of projects. Um, but you have to start somewhere. And I found uh, th there's the four volume history. There's other really helpful. There's histories of St. Paul's and Press House and other things. Um, there's there's never been anyone who's tried to sort of merge these together into some type of narrative to understand even where we started, uh, let alone where we've been in the last 50 years. So that's also I sort of spent my energy trying to just till the ground, hoping um, that I'll have more time to do this and others will come along and do even more detailed studies of of the periods that interest them. Thanks, Dan. We're in the final turn, but we do have one one more question. Thank you so much for your uh, excellence in this project and for your scholarship. Really appreciate it. Dan, the question is for you. So bringing it all the way to the present, given what you studied, what you discovered, what you know, what in a nutshell would you say to the undergrad who feels like they have to check their spirituality or religion at the door to the classroom? Yeah, um, uh, I, I'd say a few different things probably. One is a, a, a sort of uh, sentiment that's been suppressed a few times up on stage, which is, um, you're, I mean, I, I'm sort of projecting who this undergrad is, but you're not alone. Like the, the idea of being a Christian at UW should not feel um, an alien thing. There are literally tens of thousands who've come before you. Take some heart in that. Um, I would also say there is some, uh, we're, in a, we're in a quite pluralistic setting in the university. So there is some wisdom, maybe not checking it at the door, but understanding the context you're walking into in a UW classroom. Um, it's certainly not the non-sectarian Protestant classroom of the late 19th century. Um, and it's a culture now um, that really values that pluralism. I think everyone on campus values diversity, values different uh, types of religious traditions coexisting. And so d depending on this uh, undergrad and, and exactly what they want to express, I would, I would say be wise about how you, how you do that. Um, and then the third thing I would say is um, um, in ways that can sometimes, uh, in, in strategic ways, um, I think most teachers at UW, most faculty, most instructors really appreciate understanding where their students are coming from. And actually, uh, you know, there's, there's sort of the stereotype of the atheist professor that's trying to disabuse everyone of, of their religion. I haven't come across many of those at my time at UW. I've come across many more faculty who are eager and, de and sometimes desperate to understand where their students are coming from and how they can facilitate whatever topic they're in, in a way that connects with the students. And so, um, you know, I wouldn't have a blanket statement that sort of like shout out your religion on the first day of class or something, but there, don't assume that faculty or the instructors have like no interest in that part of your life. Um, particularly if it's something that's driving you and, and driving your interest in a topic uh, or, or a field of study, uh, let people know. Because uh, as long as you take my second piece of advice and be wise about it, um, it can be very enriching and it can, for the Christian student, um, and I'm assuming a Christian student in this, and I, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Um, there's a real power to integrating your faith with your academic work that can really enliven both sides um, of that equation. And so uh, that could be a, just a very powerful um, uh, way of forming yourself as a student as you go through UW. Great. Thank you. I've got to stop it there. We're, we're running short. I think you'll be around for a few minutes afterwards. So We'll be glad to try to address that question. 
Um, thank you so much. Let's thank our panelists one last time. And I, I want to remind you that um, there are a couple ways for you to immediately access um, this essay, this book. Um, we have a few hard copies in PDF form uh, on the desk there. Feel free to grab one if you if you want to walk out with a copy. Um, we will send an email that will direct you um, to the resources. They're on our front page. So you can access the, the tour, the documentary, and the essay book um, from uh, the front page. Um, the email will direct you to that as well. And then finally, when the books arrive, we will get to those to you as soon as possible. We'll send an email for those who can pick them up. Great. Um, for those who it's more difficult, we'll figure out a way to get that to you. But you're guaranteed a copy of it um, by being here tonight. So thank you. Um, at this point, I would like to invite um, Becca to come up. She will close us uh, with a benediction. If you're able and willing, would you stand with me? Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, forefathers who started the church by faith and spirit, four mothers who saved nations in God's name, brothers who inspired by faith shaped this institution, sisters who fought for equality right here in Madison, and even more so, those who treasured God's work in their hearts as they faithfully worked for the common good, those who did justly as a proof that the gospel is still alive, those who loved mercy, making the most insignificant of interactions meaningful, those who walked humbly with their God, unknown and unnamed to history. In light of such a cloud, campus ministers, professors, churches, students, who laid foundations, paved pathways, built ministries, and worked well, may we lay aside any weight and despise any shame, that we may run, that we may endure. O soul, be not weary, O heart, be not faint. May we not tire of doing good, may we see the fruit of not giving up. May we strive for the peace and holiness that without which no one will see the Lord. May we join in the race that he already began. Fellow runners, Lift your drooping hands, strengthen your weak knees, make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame, minds that are oppressed, spirits that are broken, hands that are bound, and earth that is groaning, may all be healed. May we continue the legacy that has been started on this campus. May we seek the flourishing of this city. May we do good to these people. And may we know the joy that is set before us. Heavenly Father, your kingdom come here. Your will be done here in Madison as it is in heaven. Amen. Thank you for being here.